I want to mention just a little bit to preface the first uh, questions that we're going to deal with. Two years ago at this lectureship, Brother Ricky Gambino from Birmingham, England, came and visited. Uh, Ricky had already had problems doctrinally and had uh, left, being, left off being faithful in the Lord's church. And uh, Ricky is a talented man. He is um, a constable there in Birmingham. And he has gone off into some kind of community church, Pentecostal, whatever. Now, he has sent in a number of questions based upon some things said yesterday in which he was uh, in disagreement. But let, let me make this clear, and Ken Chumley's here and can verify this. He was go he's, go he's still doing this. He was going around in this new religious group speaking in different places in that area. I don't know where all across the UK goes, but within, I imagine, most of it driving distance of, of Birmingham. But be that as it may, when he started this, he was, some of you may have noticed that on, I forgot what list it was, do you remember? Sons of Demas. Sons of Demas list, or one of them, maybe he's continuing for the faith, not ours, but another one, in which he started taking strong exception with various things. So we challenged him to a debate in Birmingham. Now he had time, though he's on a busy schedule, like some men here in secular work, to travel here and there to speak on whatever it is he speaks on. So when we told him, you know, we were funding coming over there for another reason, which was the lectureship at that time, but we would be willing to stay a week longer if he would engage in a debate. And we were working, I was working with Ken Chumley, and Ken was in contact with him. And uh, we were willing to be flexible as far as where we could find a place but we knew we first of all had to get him to agree what he would affirm and what he would negate. And then we could look for a place. And he was the one that was upset. He was the one that was challenging. So look, we're coming 5,000 miles. We're coming for another reason. But we're willing to add the expense and stay a week longer, take, bring the necessary things with us, and meet you in a debate. I said, you're the person that's claiming uh, that you've got the powers that uh, the Holy Spirit like the Apostle Paul, and you're the one that's saying we're teaching false doctrine. So it seems to me this is a grand opportunity for those people to be able to have set before them both sides, and it would be a week long, virtually a week long, a Bible study. Well, the only answer we got to that was after he said he'd have to pray and think about it for a few days, and I pretty well knew what that meant, that uh, he... He just didn't have time. But he's got time to go do these other things. And now he raises, I think there are seven questions here. He raises these questions. Now let me say this because Ricky's listening. Ricky, I don't think you mean what you say when you really want to study the Bible and the Bible only to determine the answer to your questions. And I say that on the grounds of the fruit that you have borne. And that is, we gave you opportunity. We were the ones traveling 5,000 miles and spending several thousand dollars and willing to stay a week longer than we planned and try to find a place to have such. And evidently, you just were not interested. But now you come back with this stuff when we're 5,000 miles away where we can't really have a face-to-face -face discussion like we offered you. And you won't answer this. Well, Brother Bruce will be dealing with him in a moment. But I wanted to say that so people here, some of you may remember, Ricky, uh, that um, he needs to hear what I just said, and the people need to know the background of this and the opportunity he's already been given. Not only that, but we said we'd be glad, glad if we had to, to come back over and do this. Well, uh, you know, he's the one that, that has the same power that Paul had to strike a man blind. Uh, not that I'm looking forward to being blind but that's right I would appreciate it if you'd just um, make it where I wouldn't have to wear glasses anymore I mean, for, suit me fine 
The truth of the matter is, I didn't expect him to do any of it because he does not have what he can claim. If he had what he had, he can do what he claims to be able to do. If he had what Christ had in the sense of signs, miracles that are beyond the natural laws, as was discussed yesterday, then he can do what Christ did or the apostles did or those they laid their hands on and conferred miraculous gifts to them. Truth of the matter is, Ricky can't do anything he claims to do because he does not have the Holy Spirit as Jesus, the apostles, or those they laid their hands on when they conferred miraculous gifts to them. If he did, he would do them for the same reason that they were to be done in the first century. And that is to prove that this man has God's blessings and that he speaks the will of God. He can't, so he doesn't. It's just that simple. Now, all he's going to have is words. People in the first century had the Holy Spirit in a miraculous way. They had signs, and they worked wonders. And he's not going to do anything but give us words, words, words. And that's all there's going to be. So I don't fear any kind of miracle being worked by uh, Ricky or any other man today like the Apostle Paul or Peter or others did because that work of the Spirit ceased almost 2,000 years ago. And whatever Spirit's after him, it's not the Holy Spirit. Now, Brooks, come speak to us. <clears throat> this is my first time in this format to do an open forum. Appreciate uh, Brother Brown asking me to do this. Uh, the confidence that he's expressed in my ability to do this. I'm reminded of a guy that was a chauffeur to a big college professor, and that professor would drive around to different colleges and make speeches. And uh, the chauffeur heard that same speech so many times that he told that professor, you know, I could give that speech. And so the professor says, well, next time we get to a college, you can just do it, and I'll sit in the back. And so they got there, they swapped roles, and the, the chauffeur's up there, and he gave that speech word to word, word for word, verbatim, and uh, the professor was impressed. But at the end of the speech, one of the students raised a hand and asked him a very difficult question related to the topic. And the, and the chauffeur, not missing a lick, said, you know, that's the dumbest question I've ever heard. I've never heard a question that stupid, and you, need to, you really need to be kicked out of this. In fact, this question is so simple, I'm going to have my chauffeur answer it. <laughs> so if, if I get to a point where I can't answer a question, I may have to call on my chauffeur uh, to help me out. With all due respect, and not trying to be mean-spirited or anything, the, the email that we have with these questions is, uh, in some cases, poorly worded. Uh, there's some grammatical errors, misspellings, and so it's kind of hard to read, but I believe we can get to the, an understanding of uh, the questions. And evidently, if I, if I read this right, this was a response to what was said yesterday? Yes, I think it was probably uh, Daniel's. I'm not sure Daniel's. Yeah, Daniel Denham started this. Okay, so... <laughs> no, no. <laughs> well, what I... Y'all are just missing misunderstanding. If something comes up that, I, that Daniel thinks that needs some clarification on his part, uh, he can come up and he can be my chauffeur. Um, and basically, he's asking, you clarify a few points. He says, are you saying that God today will not, under any circumstances, produce a supernatural miracle? Question. Um, all miracles are supernatural. I don't know why he said supernatural miracle. I don't know of any other kind. Uh, there's going to be a time when God is going to destroy the world, 2 Peter 3, verse 9 and following. We need to be ready for that. I, I take that was probably going to be a miracle when that happens. And some sense God is sustaining the world through natural law. That wouldn't be a miracle. That's the way God set things up from the beginning. And those natural laws are continuing today. Now sometimes, God, under certain circumstances in the Bible, 
chose to set aside natural law and in some way intervene with what was going on. Whether it was causing the sun to stand still in the sky or healing somebody's illness or raising the dead, those were all be a situation in which God would set aside natural law and intervene and do something directly to change circumstances of a situation. Okay? Now when he does that, when he sets aside natural law, then he's doing what we call acting supernaturally or above or outside of nature. Okay? God can do that when he chooses. Now, in a sense, we would answer this question, yes. We are saying that God will not, under any circumstances, uh, circumstances produce a miracle. Yet we understand that at the end of time, He's going to miraculously bring about the destruction of His creation. That there's going to be a time when all that are in the grave, John chapter 5, verse 28, will hear the voice of Christ and come forth. I take that resurrection to be a miracle, a miraculous thing. He's going to raise the dead. He's going to reunite the resurrected, changed body back with its spirit. And then we'll face the judgment. That's going to happen to the righteous and the wicked. Okay, so, so there are a sense in which God still in the future will use miracles. But if we look at the next part of the question, he continues it with this mind. Well, God, uh, he's asking, will God not under any circumstances produce a supernatural miracle? And then he says that when we pray... He will not answer that prayer of healing or anything beyond our control, etc. If not, why pray or why ask Him for anything? Okay? Well, the problem with His assumption is, is that the only way God can answer a prayer is with a miracle. And that's just not true. Sometimes He would answer a prayer with a miracle, but not always. Sometimes he would answer it providentially. Now we can take one position or another, two extremes. One, that God does everything by miracle. Right? And another position is that if he doesn't do everything by miracle, then what? He, there's no need to pray. But we see in 1 John chapter 5, verses 13, or, yeah, I'm sorry, 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 and 14, that John writes that we might know that we have eternal life and that we have confidence that whatsoever we ask, God hears. In what sense does He hear? Does He just hear it with His ear? No, He hears in the sense that He listens to our prayers and grants our request. But on the other hand, if miracles are necessary for prayers, then... Prayer ceased when miracles ceased. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 talks about the time that miracles were going to cease. Whether they be prophesied, they'll, prophecy, they'll cease. Or tongues, they'll cease. Pro, uh, knowledge, it will be done away. Right? You know, in Acts chapter 8, we have the example that miracles, the ability to do miracles, passed on by the imposition of the apostles' hands. When the last person that the apostles laid their hands on and the last apostle died, the ability to impart spiritual gifts ended. And I'm going to stand with John and call people liars. First John chapter 1 through 5, he uses the word liar in relationship to his own brethren five times. And I'll venture to say this, anybody claiming to be able to do miracles today is a liar. And I say that because the Bible says so. The age of miracles has ceased. And so I say, let God be true and every man a liar. 
He goes on, Am I also to believe that there is no point in asking elders to pray? These, again, all related to the same thing. For those in need, as Scripture does state, ask the elders to do so. Or, are you saying, that was for then and not now? If so, where was it written that it would stop? Well, if these prayers were answered by miracles, the prayers that the elders were, were asking were answered by miracles, they stopped shortly after the death of the last apostle. If they're an answer to prayer in a providential sense, then they continue because God is continuing to hear a prayer and answer them in a providential way. Let me give you an example between the difference between a natural event, a providential event, and then a miraculous event. Let's take birth, for example. A lot of people think that, that childbirth is a miracle. They say, oh, it's a miracle of childbirth. Right? No, it's not. Childbirth, not a miracle. No, notice in Genesis, when it says, Adam knew Eve, she conceived and bore Cain. That's a natural occurrence. God set it up to where everything reproduces after its kind. That's natural law. Hannah, on the other hand, was unable to conceive a child, and she prayed for God to give her a son, and if He did, He would dedicate that son to the service of the Lord. God answered that prayer, and she conceived. We understand that that was the answer to the prayer in a providential way, because it was by the process of conception that she was able to have a child. That's an example of providence. In answer to prayer. Now we come to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. The birth of Jesus was after this one. Mary, before she came together with her husband, was with child of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was conceived miraculously. It did not follow the natural pattern set forth by God in the beginning. It wasn't in answer providentially because the process wasn't followed to conceive. So it was answered miraculously. God set aside the natural order of things in order to accomplish His will. Now see, when we think about prayer, you know, we, we think about prayer as a miracle, then God would then be obligated in every instance to answer our prayers in the way that he conceived Jesus in a similar manner. Set aside nature and then what? Do his will. Furthermore, if he's answering our prayer providentially, then we have Hannah. Still follow the natural process, was able to conceive. We don't know how God operates behind the scenes to accomplish that, but it's non-miraculous. And then we have the natural order of things, such as that and me. Question or comment? Uh, let me, I, I want to say first, uh, kind of as a personal note. Uh, yeah. Oh, yes. What's your name? Skip Francis, and I'm from Liberal, Kansas. Uh, I have been involved with the work in England off and on for the last several years. Uh, I met Ricky Gambino in... Uh, at the Summer Lane congregation when we took a trip there some years ago. I believe David was there at the time, uh, along with Ken Chumley and, uh, and a few others, Keith Sisman. Uh, I considered Ricky a friend. Uh, he, we went there primarily because we were under the impression that that congregation had turned around some and it was partly a result of his work there. Uh, we also spent some time together when he came here, uh, he, was, he stayed there in the house with us at the Cone House. And it's a little frustrating for us that know Ricky because we have spent and tried to spend time either personally one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, or through the process of emails and internet and that type of thing to try to instruct him. And we're willing to continue to do that. I personally would be more than willing to go and visit with him when we go there in October, which is our plan. I know that Ken would probably agree with me if we could work something like that out. Uh, 
but I want to point out the fact that, as, as uh, Bruce has already alluded to, the Bible teaches. It's not what we teach. Mm -hmm. The Bible teaches that there will be an end to the miraculous and that it will be during this dispensation and not when the Lord comes again. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, uh, verse 10 and following I indicate that uh, very clearly. Acts chapter 8, uh, verse 18 uh, deals with the idea of the apostles and how that it was through the laying on of the apostles' hands that these miraculous things were given. There are no living apostles. There's no question about that. Uh, but I must, might also point out Ephesians chapter 4. You know, there in verse 8, it says that God gave gifts to men. And then in verse 11, it says, and God gave, and that's again that miraculous idea, God gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. But there's the word, and this is a very important word, till till we all come to the unity of the faith. Now, we're dealing with a time when there was no Bible, no New Testament Bible at least. There was no the faith available for people to utilize and to study and to know and understand in order to edify the body of Christ. But that's a situation that has long since been corrected. The till has already happened. The unity of the faith happened when this was complete. Um, miracles are kind of a funny thing because so many that believe in modern day miracles don't believe in all of them. And one of the ways that's been illustrated and has been illustrated several times in debate with uh, Pentecostals and those of that persuasion uh, one, one instance in particular I remember hearing about was where a brother brought a bottle and put it up on, a, on the podium and he said, that's poison. He says, now if our, if our uh, Pentecostal friend really believes in these miracles, then I encourage him to show that by drinking that because the Bible tells us that one of the miracles they'll be able to do is to drink poison that won't hurt them. But the other part, the other story I've heard, and I like it, I probably like that story even better, was when he was invited to Pentecostal to go out to the graveyard the next morning. And he basically said, you raise the first one, and I'll raise the next one. And of course, the indication there is that he knew that nobody was going to raise anything because those things don't exist anymore. Speaking in tongues, or speaking really in what's mostly gibberish, which is what they usually do, and, and some of the things they try, to, they try to say is faith healing, when most of it really isn't. Well, I won't say most of it, all of it isn't. Uh, is not uh, so subjective and so subject to our, our feelings about it and our, our uh, observations, and, and those are not always good either, that uh, they're not really good indicators of whether or not we really have the supernatural with us today, and we don't. Uh, but that does not mean that God does not work providentially, as Bruce pointed out, because God certainly does. But we need to understand the difference, and we are certainly willing to work with Ricky in any way we can. <clears throat> All right, so basically his question is centered around the miraculous in response to prayer. Uh, I don't know what more we could say. Miraculous age is over. God works providentially. We've seen that from examples in the scriptures. Um, yeah, I know if I'm sick, I want, the, I want the most righteous people I know praying for me. <laughs> okay? Because I know prayer works. Prayer is effective. And God answers prayer. I need to make sure that when I pray, that I work as hard as I can to make sure that I accomplish the thing that I want and I also know that God's going to work together with me, and me working with God will get it done. A lot of times people sit back and pray and, and want God to do it all. We need to do our part. Um, man, I don't know if I'm going to have time to finish if everybody's going to come up here and say it. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm just, I'm, I'm just picking on them. Who's next? Let, let me or none, and I was next in line. Uh, 
Deb McClish, Denton, Texas. Uh, the story I like better, Skip, is where a gospel preacher and a Pentecostal went to the cemetery, and the gospel preacher said, I'll pray that he stays down, and you pray that he stays up and see which one, or comes up and see which one God answers. But um, I think a distinction that uh, has not been made that needs to be made that might be helpful to some folk who have questions about miracles. All miracle activity, miraculous activity, is supernatural. But not all supernatural activity is miraculous. Mm -hmm. Now, to illustrate, uh, Bruce mentioned uh, God set in motion his natural laws that keep the planets in their orbits and keep everything, all of the natural machinery that he created operating as he chooses. Now that's supernatural. Men could not do that. As supernatural, it requires activity beyond what we could possibly do. But it's not miraculous because he set it in motion and keeps it in motion by his supernatural power. Now, when it all comes to an end, that'll be a miracle. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> another illustration is this. Uh, you mentioned uh, the natural process by which a child is conceived in its mother's womb. That is a natural process that God set in motion, but how does a spirit or soul get into that body? That is supernatural. Men cannot do that. It is beyond our capability. We do not know how God does that. It is supernatural. But who would call that a miracle? It is not a miracle, but it's supernatural power. God works providentially behind the scenes. It's always perhaps when it's God's providence Look at the book of Philemon or the letter of Paul to Philemon. Look at Esther. Mm -hmm. Who knows but what you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. That's providential. Well, God works supernaturally in providence, but it's not miraculous. Mm -hmm. And if they can see the difference between supernatural and miraculous, mm -hmm. Another they example are not of that always would, the same. Another example of that would be God working in the kings of men to appoint rulers and kings. Yes. Same thing. That's how we got a, from our president. David Brown Spring. I want to build on what he said. Uh, one of the things done by the old debaters was to uh, emphasize when it came to, they used to call it because they admitted it was a miracle, divine healing. Mm -hmm. Well, all healing is divine. When uh, you go to get your appendix out because it's infected, they remove the infected appendix but the whole setup is the way you're made it heals itself you go to a shot of an antibiotic it kills the bug your body heals itself that's divine healing how so through natural law that God's word sets in motion just like he said what we're saying is no miraculous healing today along with any other miraculous so the whole thing as he's lumped it together here is simply there needs to be a definition of terms mm -hmm. what is a miracle now I thought, wherever he is, that he did it, Daniel did well on that the other day. Because people don't make a difference. That's one of the problems, one of the many problems mm -hmm. that he has when it comes to understanding what's being said here. He just simply says anything supernatural is a miracle. Right. You can tell that by the question he asked. One thing he doesn't, he fails to understand the process of uh, Bible authority. He doesn't understand obligatory matters or optional matters. We'll see that later. Uh, he doesn't understand temporary obligatory matters and permanent obligatory matters. Uh, and so we could go on and on with that. But but let me tell you, some of us have been in his house. We've looked at his books. Mm -hmm. And he's got as much on his shelf about hermeneutics as right, I do. Right. So it's not because he hasn't had opportunity to learn. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm just saying, from just based on what I've read and the way he's worded these things and the things he's saying, like the idea of miracles, that was a temporary thing, uh, but God continues providentially. He's, he's, he's really not catching the transition between how God operated then and how he operates now.
John West, Dayton, Texas, Spring, Texas, Montgomery, wherever you want to put me, preach at the Dayton congregation. The very first question, Bruce, you've touched on this. I want to add some to what you and Skip both said. And by the way, I was among that group 2007, I believe it was, that we went to the Summer Lane congregation, met Ricky, had a very good lunch with him, talked to him for a couple hours, I believe, and have conversated with him and through the years, email, Skype, and other means. But his first question, are you saying that God today will not, under any circumstance, produce a, we'll clarify and just put in miracle, since I, we know what he's talking about. Looking at the word will not, it's not just a fact that he will not. I'll say, yes, he will not do it. But it's a fact that because of God's nature today, he cannot go against his very nature. When you think about what God set in motion for us, he has a nature that he cannot violate. If you look at Hebrews chapter 9, 16 to 17, we have a testament. And that testament was sealed by blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. But also without the shedding of, of Christ's blood and his death on the cross, there's no New Testament. And when he gave us the New Testament sealed with his blood, in that New Testament, and he goes later on talking about New Testament, Old Testament with instrumental music. You can get to that later if you have time. Uh, but we'll, with that New Testament, 1 Corinthians 13, if I do remember right, 8 through 10 tells us that the age of miracles is going to end when that which is perfect has come. First, uh, James 1.25, we know that the revealed will of the New Testament is that perfect will that was given to us. When we receive that perfect will of the New Testament, we no longer need miracles. It's not the fact that he cannot. We don't need them anymore because we have the revelation of Jesus Christ, that revealed will of the New Testament. And that's one thing that Ricky is not understanding. We have that revealed will of the New Testament, and it was told us through that revealed will that after such time there would be no more miracles. So if he is wanting a miracle today, he's going to have God going against his very nature of what he said he will or will not do. I heard an older preacher years ago preach a sermon, Things That God Cannot Do. He cannot lie, Titus 1. Another thing he cannot do, he cannot go against his own nature. And what Ricky is advocating today would have God going against his own nature, saying, I set this New Testament in force, in law, and when this is complete, you no longer need miracles, and he has him doing miracles today, going against the very thing he's taught us. And that's one thing Ricky needs to deal with. I don't want to harp on this point because it's already been mentioned twice, but Ricky, I do believe you're listening and watching, and you know who I am just as well as David and, and uh, Skip, Ken Chumley. Uh, I would like to challenge you to go to a cemetery and raise the dead. You say you can perform miracles. Anyone can slap somebody upside the head or on their back and say you got your backache healed. Something you can't see, let's have him produce something that we can see. David said he wanted better eyesight. I don't have my glasses on, but I'm to the point I'm having to wear glasses some. Heal my eyesight. Get me back to 2020. Or somebody who's lost a limb, make them walk again. Heal that. And then we can see you can produce a true miracle that was done in the first century. Until then, as David mentioned before we ever started, or as we were starting, it's all words. And I will add their empty words. You know, while, while Ken's coming up here, it's easy to sit behind a computer and shoot emails at somebody. It's another thing to stand up in the pulpit and defend your position in open forum and polemic platform. And uh, that seems to be what's going on here. It's bold in emails, but not in person. Go ahead. Ken Jumley from Belvedere, South Carolina. I'd just like for those who are listening and here and over the internet to get a little bit of a background of where Ricky is now. He's with the Renewal Christian uh, Center in Solly Hall, Birmingham. Just a few things about what they state they believe. They believe in the gifts and ministries of the Holy Spirit given to individuals and to the church. These ministries include apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, and pastors. They also state they believe in baptism by total immersion for those confessing faith in Jesus. However, another part of their belief states that the church is made up of all regardless of denomination, nationality, or color, 
who have truly repented and have made Jesus Christ Lord of their lives. Where does that place baptism in the plan of salvation? Ricky needs to answer that question as well. And by the way, it also states here the Vanilla Christian Center is affiliated with the Free Methodist Church of Europe. So it's a Methodist background, holiness background. Well, the first thing uh, I want to say, Danny Douglas, Mount Pleasant, Tennessee, Central Church of Christ, that uh, I appreciate Brother Denham's lesson yesterday. And one thing that I really appreciated, among many other things that he said, was about deism, that the Bible doesn't teach deism, that God wound up the universe and set it in motion, that our prayers actually are effectual. And uh, James taught that, the effectual fervor prayer of a righteous man availeth much, James 5, 16. Every day we pray regarding things that to a certain degree are out of our control. We do all that we can, but we know that the Lord's part is greater than ours. And to teach the idea that God does not intervene in the affairs of men and work providentially, I do, I do not believe the Bible teaches this. In uh, the 107th Psalm, in four places, the scripture says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Now, that goodness and wonderful works is not confined to the miraculous. It, certainly, it would include all of his great works. But the second thing that I want to say is that this question is based on the assumption that God's miraculous works are greater than his providential works. And that's not true. All of God's works are marvelous and wonderful. And uh, in Hebrews 1, 3, this has to do with our Lord, Christ Jesus, who is deified, that he upholdeth all things by the word of his power. And he is even doing that to this day. And I want to connect with that, uh, James 5, 16, the end of the verse. <clears throat> the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And so to teach the truth regarding the age of miracles is ended is not to deny that our prayers today are effective with God. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man does indeed continue to do much good. And thank you. Come on. Sean Francis, Liberal, Kansas. Um, first thing I would like to say is I'm not a preacher, but uh, I've, I'm 22 years old and I've uh, grown up in a church and I've had good instruction. Um, as far as this subject with prayer and miracles, um, from what I from what I know from the Bible that I learned from is that uh, the Bible teaches that um, that uh, prayers now aren't answer, aren't answer, answered miraculously but providentially mm -hmm. but um, and uh, the way, and it's not only by prayer alone Prayer cannot cannot truly an, can, cannot truly be answered unless you have a constant prayerful mind, godly attitude, and are following the scriptures daily. You cannot you cannot have prayers answered just by prayer alone. You have to be following the scriptures daily, and they will be answered for you. You can't you know, like if you're in if you're part of the world and you're trying to make a prayer to God, you can't be uh you can't have the mind that. You know, I would like to be answered for uh, for the lottery. I would like a million dollars for the lottery or anything like that. Prayer is not answered for those kind of things. Right. You have to have the constant, godly, prayerful attitude and be following the scriptures constantly in order to be answered by the Lord. That's a good point. You know, we're talking about God answering prayers and <clears throat> really dealing with how he answers prayers, but we need to be in a position to pray. Prayer is one of the greatest spiritual gifts that we have, and they're all located in Christ, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. All spiritual blessings 
are in Christ Jesus. And one of the greatest spiritual blessings we have is prayer. And we have to be in a position to pray. Good point. Good point. Uh, anybody else? All right. I'm going to move on. I think we've dealt with the prayer and the miracles sufficiently. I want to get on the instrumental music. He brings up a couple of uh, arguments trying to support instrumental music. Uh, one of them is, well, he really brings up three arguments. One of them has to do, well, it's in the Old Testament. It's in heaven, so why not in the church? Well, the church isn't in the Old Testament. The church is not yet in heaven, so... We can't appeal to the Old Testament for authority. And when we get to heaven, if you want to use the instrument, by all means, right? <laughs> because that's where God authorized it. It's a matter of authority. It's not authorized in the New Testament worship. Ephesians 5.19, what does it say? Sing. It's specific. A specific command tells us what God wants. And when he tells us what he wants then that's what he gets. And if we give him anything else, we sin. You know, when we think about music, there's two different kinds of music, vocal and instrumental. If he would have just said make music, then we would have an option, wouldn't we? We could sing, we could play, we could sing and play. But when he specifies sing, we're limited to what he authorizes. And again, I think he's missing a fundamental uh, point on... Authority. He also makes an argument based on the Old Testament that David added. And God allowed David to add instrumental music to the old law. And why can't we, since God gives us the new law, why can't we now add it and God approve of it today? Well, there's a big difference between what's going on today and what was going on in the Old Testament times. God did give the law. But then he had inspired men to come along later in a progressive way that applied, made application to the law. In Acts chapter 2, we find that David is a prophet. He was a spokesman for God. And so the authority for David as, uh, adding instrumental music was not necessarily on his own initiative, but based on the fact of authority that he was a prophet. And he had God's approval. Today, the New Testament, we don't have a similar situation in which David lived. We have the giving of the law, and as was pointed out earlier by one of the speakers, he said, what? Well, God gave the law. We no longer need those miracles to reveal it or confirm it. It was once for all delivered, once for all time delivered, Jude 3. And so we don't have that progressive revelation that they had in the Old Testament. So, again, God wouldn't accept additions today as he did in the Old Testament. I had two people. Just very quickly on the heaven argument. You know, if it's done in heaven, yeah. it can be done on earth. Um, Jesus said marriage will end in heaven. We'll be as the angels. So should we not have there marriage anymore now by that logic? Right. There's also people under the throne that were beheaded. <laughs> Gene Hill, Indianola, Mississippi. Uh, every one of our elementary school children know the, the game Simon Says. Simon Says, touch your head. Simon Says, touch your shoulders. Touch your chest. Every child that touched their chest would be out of the game. We get that. Colossians 3.16, Paul, and let's just assume we had a child up here that could play the old rugged cross. We had a piano. Paul said, speaking to your, uh, Paul said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, the old rugged cross. Now what if that child started banging away on the piano? He'd be out of the game, and he wouldn't know that. Mm -hmm. he, you wouldn't take any explanation for that child. He would be out of the game. But if he started singing the old rugged cross, he would still be in the game. But yet when we come to the scriptures, people assume that there has to be something extra in there other than what those words expressly say. As I said yesterday, just read those words in their common everyday meanings to see what it says. Simon says. Daniel Dunham, uh, the North River Church of Christ in uh, Parish, Florida. First on the heaven argument, uh, will Ricky tell us, are those instruments from the Baldwin Company? 
Steinway, Horner, Yamaha. Uh, the text he is using or appealing to are symbols. They involve symbolic, figurative language. Mm -hmm. And by definition, Ricky, a symbol does not symbolize itself. If you have a symbol, uh, you have it standing for something as far as meaning. Uh, the, the entire idea that there are physical, material, mechanical instruments in heaven is an absurdity. And, and, it, and it does, it, 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 it's ignorance. It's an argument drawn from ignorance. Uh, there are no Baldwin and Steinways in heaven. Anyway, on the David argument, Second Chronicles chapter 29. Maybe you need to pay attention to this verse. And he set the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with psalteries, and with harps. And I think those are instruments, right? Mm -hmm. According to the commandment of David and of Gad, the king's seer. You know what the word seer here is? Roe. It's a word for a prophet. Mm -hmm. And Nathan the prophet. Prophetes in Greek, Navi in Hebrew, spokesman for God. For so was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. What David did, he had authority to do. And that's what we're demanding, Ricky, of you. Amen. Yeah, David didn't do it on his own. No. That's the point. Even though it wasn't initially written in the law of Moses... God has the right God has a right to add to it. Man, if David would have done it on his own, it would have been a sin. But he had God's approval and authority. He makes one more old, old, weak argument on the tuning fork. Okay? Uh, we've heard this before. Well, you got a tuning fork. Everybody knows a tuning fork, a pitch pipe. Is to get one note so the song leader can start on key, right? It's not being used during the song, like an instrument. And just because a musician calls a tuning fork an instrument doesn't authorize it in New Testament worship, other than to get that first note. Now, if the, if the song leader's up here beating time with that tuning fork, I would have a problem, right? Because that would be doing the thing during the song. The tuning fork is not part of the worship. Okay? And it's not authorized as an instrument. Michael. Uh, Michael Hatcher from Bellevue Congregation in Pensacola. Just to add one thing in relationship to the progressive in, uh, nature of inspiration in the Old Testament. We don't have that today. We have the completed revelation of God's will, the faith that was once for all delivered unto the saints. It's not continuing today, and so it doesn't change. And God authorized singing today. And we're interested in what we do today, not what they did then, not what they, or what some might suppose that people will do in heaven um, moving right along about five minutes do you want me to move on to that last question you gave me or do you want to keep with this okay I have another question that David gave me that's not related to Richie Gamb Ricky Gambino uh, and it's kind of a lengthy question can you explain further about Matthew 18 and verse 15? This context, Jesus is telling, uh, instru giving instructions on how to deal with someone that sins against you who is a brother. Uh, and basically, I'm gonna, instead of reading, I'm just going to run down the process. When someone sins against you, you're to go to that person between you and him alone and tell him his error. If he repents, you've gained your brother. Right? If not... Then you take two or three witnesses with you so that every word may be established. If he will, still won't hear you, in other words, repent, then you tell it to the church 
And when you tell it to the church, if they still don't repent, then you consider them as a publican and a sinner. Okay? You separate. You withdraw. All right? That's to deal with a brother in sin. Uh, they ask specifically, what does it mean to take it before the church? I understand that to mean that at some point when, when a brother in Christ or sister in Christ is in sin and you go through the process and they still haven't repented, sooner or later the church needs to be involved and informed. And that's what it means to take it before the church to relay the sin to the church. Now, the brethren can be involved in the restoration process and try to then encourage, from a congregational standpoint, this person to repent. If they won't hear the church, then you, then you withdraw. Um, where do the elders fit into this? Well, the elders fit in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 talks about the elders who are supposed to take the oversight of the congregation, of the flock, oversight of the flock. The elders need to be involved in this process. If I was at a congregation uh, that had elders and I had a brother sin against me and they would not listen to me and repent, the first people I would want to get involved with that would be the elders. And have the elders go with me to meet with that person. There's your two or three that can go with you. Who better to have go with you than the elders? Okay? And then if they won't hear them, then the elders being in the leadership role, taking the oversight of the congregation, I believe it would be their responsibility to present it to the church. Okay? And then take the lead in the withdrawal process. Now, I believe that's the elders' role. Acts 20 and verse 28, Paul warns the elders at Ephesus that after his departing, grievous was what you're in. Well, what are you supposed to do, elders? Take heed to yourselves and over the flock over the which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. The elders have that responsibility to oversee the spiritual well-being of the, the flock. And if one sheep is sick, they need to be involved in the healing process. Okay? Now, what is the time frame in when this should take place? Well, uh, in the case of an erring brother, you're going to have to go. If that doesn't work, take two or three with you. If that doesn't work, then tell it to the church. Give the church time to try to reach that lost brother or sister in Christ. But ultimately, you're going to have to withdraw now, the time frame is not always specified. We do have a couple of examples of 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and the situation where the uh, brother in Christ had uh, married his father's wife. I take that to mean his stepmother. Regardless, he was living in adultery. And uh, the brethren weren't dealing with it. In fact, they were puffed up. And Paul tells them, when you come together, I take that to mean the next time you come together. Commit such a one to Satan. You know, if somebody's in sin and they refuse to repent and nothing you're doing is making progress, you need to withdraw. The time frame of that may vary from situation to situation as you carry out the process of withdrawal. Sometimes, such as in the case of uh, Titus, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Titus 3 and verse 10 when someone is a heretic, that means somebody that's factious or divisive, somebody that is uh, upsetting the congregation and causing division, after the first and second admonition, refuse. And so some cases, such as in the fornicator, whose sin is influencing and permeating the congregation just as leaven does bread, you need to act on that immediately. Okay? And take care of it. In the case when somebody is a heretic and is causing division, take care of that after the first and second admonition. Refuse. It's pretty simple. The problem that I've seen, I've been a preacher for 25 years and an elder for several years. I don't remember how long, but it, sometimes it seems like a long time. Um, the hardest job that I have as a preacher and now as an elder 
is confronting people who are in sin. It's a grave responsibility. And it's a responsibility that elders need to take serious because souls are at stake. And the Hebrews writer says, we're, elders are going to give an account how they wash the flock. Okay? They're going to give an account. It's a serious thing. And to sit and, and be in a confrontation with somebody and have to talk to them about their sin, maybe something that's very intimate and personal, it's a hard thing to do. And that difficulty is compounded when it's friends or family, long acquaintance, work, uh, co-workers, or whatever. It, that difficulty is compounded. But the elder or the member or the preacher cannot allow sentiment and feelings and love for a person to dissuade them from their duty or cause them to act in an untimely manner. The longer sin continues, the harder it's going to be to get somebody to repent. Their conscience can become seared. That's right. So the sooner we act, the better. Not only for the soul of the person that's lost, but also for the soul of the congregation. Elders need to realize that that, that person is not the only one involved. We got to worry about the entire congregation. Think about it this way: the parable of the ninety and nine. A fella has a hundred sheep, right? One wanders away; he's got ninety-nine left. One percent loss isn't that bad, right? Well, if we was talking about a company, that might be true. But when we're talking about Jesus and souls. 1% loss is too much. How long do you think that sheep was lost before the shepherd went to look for it? Do you think he waited a few months before he acted? No. That shepherd's going to look at those sheep several times a day, make sure they're all there if one's missing, put the rest of them in the fold so they'll be safe, and he's going to look high and low for that one sheep. And when he finds it, he's going to rejoice. And he's going to bring it home. And he's going to tell his friends and family, I found the sheep that was lost. One percent. One percent loss is too much. What's more valuable than a soul? And elders are supposed to watch for a soul. Examples. What are the examples? Uh, well, we've given one, 1 Corinthians 5. We've given another, Titus uh, chapter 3, also is there a pattern to be followed with public sin or is there a different pattern to follow? Well, there is. It's a, and the difference is this. If little Johnny's in school and he's going over his new vocabulary words and he spells cat, K-A-T, on his paper, the teacher can take little Johnny aside and say, you know, Johnny, um, that's not how you spell cat. But if she tells little Johnny to come up in front of the class and write cat on the board, and he writes K-A-T, now I have a different thing, don't I? Johnny has just spelled cat wrong in front of the whole class. And she has to correct little Johnny. Well, that's just me, poor little Johnny. He didn't know, but he was sincere in the way he spelled it, even though he spelled it wrong. And besides, uh, you know, K sounds like C, and, and, you know, we're all trying to spell cat the same, you know, different ways. We're just getting there a different way. No, the teacher needs to tell little Johnny in front of those kids. That's the way Paul did Peter in Acts chapter 2. He was stood him to the face because he was to be blamed. He rebuked him before all. Right? That's how you deal with public sin. And liberals will do it to you every time. Did you go to him first when he spread his false doctrine across the whole brotherhood? No, I didn't. And no, I don't have to. Well, you took just about five minutes over. I think it's a very important point to be made because um, <laughs> what we dealt with yesterday was bringing that up as one of the things that uh, we should have done. Well, that's a misapplication of the Scripture. And we're just as opposed to that as we are any other transgression of God's Word. 
Well, we're through for this afternoon. Be back tonight. We're through. Up and rise. Go. Walk. <laughs> <laughs> you know